We've got a lovely in-studio guest for you guys. Uh, Professor Stephen Kinzer uh, joins us. His book is Reset, Iran, Turkey, and America's Future, and it's got a fascinating thesis. Uh, welcome, Professor. Great to be here. All right. Now, uh, l let's talk about uh, the general idea behind the book. Uh, are you saying that we should realign ourselves uh, as far as what allies we're picking in the Middle East, and perhaps Israel is not the best ally to have there? Is, is that right, or, or am I stating that wrong? Well, there's something to what you say. I, I'd put it this way. I, I come to my book, uh, first of all, by talking a lot about history of 20th century Turkey and 20th century Iran, how these countries became the very interesting and very countries that are very different from the rest of their Muslim neighbors. And then in the end, I talk about what all this means now that I've told you everything about what Turkey is and what Iran is. So why is that interesting? And I come up with what amounts to about, about a three-part conclusion. My first conclusion is, our policy in the Middle East is hopelessly stuck in a past era. We have a great policy to deal with the Middle East of 30 years ago, but that's not there anymore. And our policy doesn't change. The Middle East has changed tremendously. The threats to the U.S. have grown, but also there are very tantalizing opportunities for us there, but we can't take advantage of them because our policy is not changing. So that's point number one. Point number two is if we want to have a new approach to the Middle East, uh, we should probably try to work with other countries. I think that the U.S. does need partners and needs to listen to advice. However, we're not a very good advice-taking nation. America's good at giving advice, but we're not so good at listening. And we feel, for example, in the Middle East, we get the Middle East. Okay, other countries don't get it. They don't understand it, including countries that live there. And we should, therefore, tell them what to do and not listen to their advice. I think we got to get past that and find some partners. And then my third part of my thesis is, if you're going to find partners, who would they be? Not tomorrow or next week, but for the whole 21st century. Um, and I think you look for countries that have two qualifications. Number one, they should be countries whose long-term strategic goals are somewhat parallel to your own. And number two, they should be countries whose societies are something like yours. You don't want to have just uh, relationships between governments, and regime to regime, or ruling elite to ruling elite. So these two, when you look at these two criteria, countries whose strategic interests parallel ours, and countries whose societies are something like ours, Turkey and Iran are the only two. Really? Because I think a lot of people would look at that and go, well, obviously Israel. Well, Israel has been a valuable ally for the United States in the past, and most of the Cold War, Israel and Saudi Arabia were our two allies. And we shaped our policy toward that part of the world according to what seemed to be good for Israel and what seemed to be good for Saudi Arabia. Now, with Saudi Arabia, I feel like there's a lot of reasons why this relationship is not sound. Uh, our societies have nothing in common, and the strong influence of uh, radical fundamentalism there and the money the, from Saudi Arabia that's going to promote militant anti-Americanism around the world makes them less than ideal partners for us. Now, Israel is a little different. I think it is right for the U.S. to continue to be a partner and a supporter and a friend of Israel. But when I was in Israel researching this book, I noticed an interesting current in Israeli opinion, and I think maybe it's parallel here in the U.S., that there's a growing number of people in Israel, I think, who are asking themselves, is our government taking steps that seems uh, smart to protect us in the short run, but actually in the long run are undermining our security. I really believe that Israel is not going to be able to defend itself indefinitely only by military means. The best protection for Israel over the long run is a calm neighborhood. And therefore, anything that calms the region down is good for Israel, even if some Israeli leaders tell us at the moment that this isn't what they want. Well, I couldn't agree more with that. but. How does that affect our ability to be long-term allies with them? I mean, well, I'm not, I shouldn't assume that they're going to go in that direction. Is your assumption the opposite, that they're not going to go in that direction, and that hence the, the warring with the neighbors then does not make them a good ally? Or what's your thinking along those lines? I feel that we can't be held hostage to the hothouse environment of internal Israeli politics. And that's what's essentially shaping the direction of Israel. The political system in Israel is quite strange, and, and it gives a special influence to fringe and radical and fundamentalist groups. And that shapes Israeli day-to-day -day policy. So over the long run, I don't think it's right for the U.S. to decide what's good for Israel anymore by listening only 
to what the leaders of Israel tell us. I think we've gotten to well, a point that, where maybe we should be participating in that decision. Yeah, on that note, we totally agree. I, that, that, I don't think that's, at least from our perspective, I don't think that's controversial. So now, of course, the other part that made a lot of people in Washington, or if they're watching, <laughs> go, what? is uh, your thoughts on Iran. Why, why do you think they're a natural ally to us when it, right now we're being told by the establishment that they're our top enemy? It's true. We've been fed this uh, sort of axis of evil, cartoonish uh, idea about Iran, and, and certainly the Iranian regime is not very pleasant, and they'd be a very prickly partner in this incarnation. Uh, nonetheless, Iran is a really fascinating country, and I've just come back from a couple of weeks there. Uh, there are two things about Iran that I think qualify it as a good partner for the U.S. First of all, although Iranian regime is quite repressive, uh, the society is amazingly democratic. Uh, people have had generations to assimilate the ideas of democracy there. It, democracy is, is a system they chose themselves. It was not imposed on them. Seventy percent of Iranians are under the age of 30. Uh, so you have the makings of a very democratic country if we can somehow peel off that religious regime. And I think that will happen as we move forward. Now, the more uh, unusual concept that I'm trying to get across is that not only are Iran and the U.S not fated to be enemies forever, but we actually have a lot in common in terms of our strategic interest. What would that be? First of all, Iran has a huge ability to stabilize Iraq. In fact, they can probably do more to stabilize Iraq than any country in the world, including the United States. We are eager to get out of Iraq, but we don't want Iraq to erupt in violence as soon as we leave. Iran can help make sure that doesn't happen if it wants to. Iran also has huge ability to influence Afghanistan. A lot of Afghanistan used to be part of Iran up until Iran lost a few wars in the 19th century. Iran is very deeply uh, networked inside Afghanistan. Uh, Iran is eager to assure the free flow of energy from the Persian Gulf to the West. Iran is the bitter enemy of radical movements like Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So going forward, when you look at state interests, which don't change as regimes change, you see that actually no strategic goal that the U.S. wants to reach in the Middle East can be achieved without Iran. And in fact, of course, Iran had a democracy until we overthrew it, uh, which Barack Obama acknowledged in his speech in Cairo. So uh, we went in a 50-year wrong direction there with Iran. So, um, and you know, conservatives, their heads explode when you tell them this. But Iran being the Muslim fundamentalist country that it is now is definitely partly our fault. If we hadn't overthrown their democracy and imposed a Shah that gave a great majority of their oil revenue to us and the British, we wouldn't have the problem we had you know, with Ayatollahs. Now, having said that, how do you deal with the short term where you have a regime that is undemocratic, you know, fixed the elections, illegitimate, and, and opposed to our interests? Uh, here's what I think I'd like to do with Iran. Uh, if the democratic movement in Iran were telling us, isolate those people, don't talk to them, uh, treat them as pariahs, then I think we would want to listen carefully to that because those are the people who support values that we profess to support. But they're not telling us that. The democratic movement in Iran is in a bad position. It doesn't have any good options. The best of the bad options is that the regime would somehow be drawn out of its paranoia and its fear. So the people who support what we would like to call American values in Iran are telling us, try to engage our leaders. Now, how could we do that? Not the way we're doing it now. Our present policy is to tell them, you have to negotiate on the nuclear issue and accept restrictions on your nuclear program. But it's not realistic to expect Iran to give up what is effectively the highest card in its diplomatic hand without getting something in return. So what I'd like to see us do is what we did with China when we made that opening in the 1970s, which is make a list of all the things we don't like about Iran and what they do in the world, but also ask Iran to make a similar list. What would they like us to change? And what would they want from us? And then see if you're opening up the agenda, if the Iranians are willing to make a bargain in exchange for things that we can provide for Iran. Well, uh, Professor Kinzer, though, that's you're actually talking about actual negotiations. And, you know, the establishment in D.C. frowns upon that. 
they think, <laughs> what are you talking no, we tell Iran what to do. They don't tell us what to do. We're not going to negotiate with them. It's just a matter of how much they bend to our will. You're, you're exactly right. And this is the big problem with our relations with Iran. It is that we're being guided by our emotions. We are really angry at Iran. We've been angry at them for 30 years. And we want to hit them back because we feel they've hit us. It's like the little boys in the sandbox routine. But emotion is always the enemy of sound foreign policy. If we leave the emotion outside the room and just think coolly only about what's good for us, this is not a giveaway. This is not something we're handing to the Iranians. Just think about what's good for us. And then you begin to realize some kind of a rapprochement with Iran would actually be a great leap for our security interests. I, I want to ask one more question about Iran. We're talking to Professor Stephen Kinzer. He's the author of the book Reset, Iran, Turkey, and America's Future. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, Iran today, you know, we obviously have the elections that were rigged and then we have the Green Movement, but you wrote in one of your articles that the Green Movement's in a lot of trouble, um, so, and that it might actually be over. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, and then, then I, I, I kind of want to know what they did wrong. Uh, I've just come back from a couple of weeks traveling around Iran. And this question was the main question that I went there to ask. So what happened to the Green Movement? We were reading all those stories about hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Now we don't see those stories, so what happened? I got more or less the same answer from the dozens of people that I spoke to on streets and asked this question to. And they said more or less this. We tried that. It didn't work. They beat us. And they threw us in jail. And we don't want to be beaten anymore or thrown in jail. They're very strong. We're, fr we're afraid now. So uh, it's over for now. We probably will get the result that we want over the long run, but uh, we're not going to get it immediately. So uh, that is probably understandable for a country that has 25 centuries of history to think that way, but that's not our schedule in America. We want something that's going to happen there right now, and nothing is going to happen right now. Well, you know, but do, while that commotion was happening, and you know, after the elections and everybody's worked up, et cetera, I was saying on the show, they got to do it now. Because if they don't, of course, over the course of time, it's a dictatorial government. They will pull people in, they will arrest them, they'll torture them, and they'll win. It, so the only chance that that movement had was in that immediate time frame, right? And once they retract, though, and, and are in the position they're in now, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the next... I mean, they could go another 30 years without... Yeah, I mean, I, look at what happened in Tiananmen Square. And then they went back in their shell. I don't think that you're going to have to wait another 30 years, but uh, you are right that uh, there's a reason why governments use repression against protesters, and that is that it usually works. Now, you asked what went wrong with the movement. Uh, I think you can see at least three weaknesses in that movement from the perspective of, of today. First of all is there's no coherent leadership. Second, there's no coherent program. They have not even answered the fundamental question, uh, do you want to overthrow the religious regime or do you want to reform it? You've got to have an answer to that if you've got a program. And the third thing they lack is a big social base. This is the major difference between this protest movement and the protest movement that overthrew the Shah in the 1970s. That movement had support at every level of society. The Green Movement was never able to achieve that. Hmm. Well, look, I know they were a little split on it, but let me throw something controversial out there. Um, I thought that in the midst of those uprisings, that if they didn't pull people, and I'm not necessarily advocating this, I'm just saying as a looking back on it, what would have worked and what wouldn't have worked. In order for it to work, they had to pull a couple of guys out of the buildings, drag them in the streets, and honestly kill them. Okay, if they, if because if the regime is not scared for its life, they're not going to voluntarily change. It's naive to think they're voluntarily going to change. But there's the other side of this, and I think this is something very important to understand about Iranians. There's no people in the world who understand better than Iranians how dangerous violent overthrows of governments can be. They have a terrible, tragic experience from the late 70s. Everybody at every level of society united against the Shah, even people who hated each other and had totally different ideas about where Iran should go. They all agreed on one thing. Whatever comes next, it's got to be something better. What happened? They got something worse. Now I think Iranians have deeply assimilated this idea. It's dangerous to overthrow a regime you don't like violently because there can always be something worse. And I think they I have to you. weigh that. 
No, I hear you. I'm not advocating for it, right? And and it, I've always advocated for nonviolence. But I'm just saying, as a matter of practical, are, are you going to overthrow the government or are you not? And my guess is that if you if you if you want to overthrow the government, that you had to pull people in the streets. If, asking him politely wasn't going to get the job done, and it didn't get the job. If done. you wanted to do it at that time, yes, you would have had to do that. We we can see that now, and I think Iranians were not willing to do that. Now, over time. Uh, I think the rise of this young generation is going to resolve this problem. You are going to see a transition. We're going to get the result that we want in Iran, but it's going to be on their schedule. And the big problem is, will the centrifuges keep spinning, and will we wind up in some huge nuclear confrontation before we get there? All right, Professor Kinzer, we're, we're basically out of time here. We didn't touch on Turkey at all. The show is called The Young Turks, although it's <laughs> an American show, obviously. but. Uh, can we just agree that Turkey is in fantastic shape going forward? Turkey is the model we would like other countries in the Muslim Middle East to follow. It's a thriving democracy and a booming economy. If you're walking around in Iran and Syria and uh, Iraq or uh, Egypt and asking yourself, what kind of country would I like to have better than the one I have? Turkey is the great example, and that's why anything we can do to promote Turkey as an example for the Islamic world is not only good for them, but especially good for us. Uh, you know what? i got to do a real quick follow-up. Thomas Friedman wrote this absurd article here. The, now you know my thought on it. Sit linking Turkey with Hamas and Hezbollah and saying that's it now. Now that they're against Israel, they're of no use to us. Uh, w what do you think of that kind of thought? It's crazy to think that Turkey is either turning Islamist in its society or that its foreign policy is Islamist. There's a lot of anger in Turkey, not so much against Israel, but specifically about the Gaza invasion and the Gaza occupation. That's what's caused this uprising there. If Israel had not invaded Gaza and just was Israel, it would have maintained the same good relationship with Turkey that it's had over many decades. Uh, but there's an intense emotion in Turkey about what's happening in Gaza. I hope this relationship isn't frayed uh, too badly because it's important for Israel to have a, a bridge out of its isolation. Turkey is the only Muslim country in the Middle East that can play that role. So that relationship is very important for peace. And I hope Turkey doesn't learn a bad lesson from us, which is shape your foreign policy while you're really angry. <laughs> that, yeah, that didn't work out for us uh, after 9-11. All right. Now, uh, the book is called Reset Iran, Turkey and America's Future. Uh, Dr. Kinzer has a reading uh, today, actually, if you're in the Los Angeles area, at 7 p.m. Pacific at Borders in Westwood. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Love being with Young Turks.